good morning, everyone. If you could take your seats, we'd appreciate that. Isn't God good? He really is. That was a great testimony. I'm really excited about this little outreach we're going to do uh, immediately following the service. Uh, if you've never done one of these before, this would be the one to jump in on. Uh, this is not cold calling. These, every one of these folks have asked for us to come. They're expecting us. And uh, th these are open doors for us to go and just, just share the love of Jesus. It'll only take a few minutes, and it could change lives. It often does. So if you'd like to participate, we'd love to have you. Like I say, if we're if you know many hands makes light work, right? Yeah. So we're we're grateful. Well, God is good, and all the time. Well, that was weak. I know. So God is good. All right, and all the time. Wonderful. Well, my message this morning is, is a, a continuation of our series that we've begun on, on the Holy Spirit. And I uh, want to talk about the Holy Spirit this morning. And my, the title of my message is Rivers of Living Water. Rivers of Living Water. And if you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 7. And uh, this is one of the most uh, profound and simple passages of scripture commands of Christ that you're, you're going to find anywhere and and Jesus is like that isn't he he's very simple and yet it's incredibly profound what he says is direct it's on point and yet it goes it goes deeper than uh, you can possibly fathom so we're going to begin uh, in chapter 7. I want to look down on verse 37. And as we're thinking about the Holy Spirit, and, you know, we've talked about uh, who the Holy Spirit is. He's not a force. He's a person, second person of the Trinity. And we, we realize that the Holy Spirit is, is God. It's a him, not an it. The Holy Spirit has mind, has will, has purpose, and he is active. He's active in the earth. He, together with the Father and with the Son, he is accomplishing and directing the will of God. The, the power of God is, is contained in the Holy Spirit, and it is distributed to us so that we can accomplish the will of God in our generation. He's often, the Holy Spirit is often overlooked. Many people talk about the Father, of course, and the, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit often gets sort, short shrift. We want to sort of make up for that. We want to focus a little on Him. And as we've been doing that, there's, there has just come, I think, a real sweet uh, spirit, a real sweet uh, outpouring, and, and I'm sure it's not just coincidental that we happen to be in the middle of a 40-day period of prayer and fasting. How many of you are participating in that? It's, it's been very rich for me and for our family. We've enjoyed that. And so we come to the, the portion of our teaching on the Holy Spirit where I, I want us to start thinking about how, how I can receive the Holy Spirit. How can I welcome the Holy Spirit? What is that all about? I believe in the Holy Spirit. I, I want more of Him. How do I do that? If this message had a subtitle, it would be How to Receive the Holy Spirit. And, and I, I, I want us to think about this a little bit. And of course, Jesus always gets it right. And he goes right to the point. So we're going to begin in verse 37 of chapter 7. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Now, a couple things you need to understand. When he talks about festival, he's talking about the festival of tabernacles. The, our Jewish friends in Hebrew, they call that Sukkot. Sukkot. It happens in the fall. And 
And you can read about it in the Torah, in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, it, it happens at, at the harvest time. And people would, it, it was called tabernacle or booths. People would build little, little shelters and they would invite, what? Okay. <laughs> I thought we had a theologian challenging me here. I welcome any and all challenges. But uh, yes, it, and it was a celebration, really, of, of the harvest. And what they would do is this feast would last an entire week. And there would be much eating and drinking, as you can imagine, as God commanded them. You know, eat and drink and, and, and rejoice before the Lord, and so they would. And uh, this, this was going on in, in uh, John chapter 7. And, and Jesus uh, has a mind to go into Jerusalem. He is planning to go to Jerusalem, but the problem is if he does, they'll kill him because they've set a trap and they're watching for him. They want to kill him. I mean, by they, I mean the, the religious authorities who are jealous of him. They're jealous of his power. They're jealous of the authority that he has with the people. And they're very concerned, and so they've laid traps for him. And... Uh, uh, in fact, even his, his Jesus brothers come to him and they say, look, why don't you go to the festival and, and uh, you, lots of people will be there and you can, you can perform miracles and, uh, um, you know, that way, you know, everybody will hear about you and you'll get a bigger following. And then it's an interesting uh, little side note there. It says that they themselves did not believe in him. See, they were just trying to, like, get Jesus to do magic tricks. I think, or something like that. And, and so, anyway, Jesus holds back, and, he, and he, he sends them on. No, you go. You go. And so the festival is going on, and, and uh, people are eating and drinking. I don't, I don't, it, how many of you like to go to, like, a county fair or a festival? What happens at these festivals? Well, one thing, we eat a lot. You know, you can get corn dogs, and you can get elephant ears, and I don't know, all kinds of things. And half the fun of going there is all the stuff you get to eat. And uh, this festival is no different. I don't imagine they have elephant ears there, but they probably had things relevant to that culture, and they were enjoying themselves. And so a week-long feasting and drinking of things, and, and, <clears throat> and Jesus comes on the last day. He shows up on the last and final day. It says the most important day, greatest day, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood <clears throat> and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Well, wait a second. What have they been doing for a week? Eating and drinking. Who could possibly be thirsty? What is he talking about? What is he talking about? I want to focus on essentially three commands, three direct statements of Jesus. The first is this. Oops, come on, let's do this. Jesus says, if anyone who is thirsty, second, let him come to me. Third, let him drink. So let's look at this idea of thirsty. Who could he possibly be talking to? These people could not be thirsty. They could not be hungry. They are completely surfeited. They are, they are completely, they've had all they need, all they want. And yet, Jesus is talking about something else. He's talking about a different kind of thirst. He's talking about a soul thirst. I'm not talking about a physical thirst. How many of you know that there is a soul thirst? In fact, I would say this. I would say that God has created reality in such a way as to allow that thirst, allow us to feel that thirst, that soul thirst. When God created the, the universe, when God created the heavens and the earth, when God created the garden and put man in there, it was perfect. It was good. And Adam and Eve had access to all of the trees of the field that they could eat, and there was a river of life there. It was everything they could possibly need 
But you know what happened? They rebelled against God. They turned away from God. They did exactly the thing he told them not to do. And they sinned, and that sin brought destruction, and it brought death, and it's brought sorrow and grief into the world. And this is not a small thing. The, the fall has affected every part of our lives, every part, so that life is difficult, life is hard. There is much grieving, there is much sorrow, and you don't have to live very long to, to find it, to discover it. There is so em it's, there's so much emptiness out there. I'm really struck with this generation as I see them. Uh, I mean, I've never seen a generation who are more connected to the Internet, connected to high-tech devices, connected to social media, and are yet so disconnected from one another. There is such a sense of loneliness out there. How many of you know you can be in a crowd and be lonely because you're not connected? There's no intimacy. There's no connection. And our culture is grieving. Our culture is lonely. Our culture is broken. There's a thirst out there. It's like a desert, spiritually. Not physically. Of course, you can have tons of stuff to drink. Coffee will do in the morning. But this isn't what he's talking about. He's talking about that soul thirst. Jesus is calling for those that are thirsty. Those that are thirsty. If anyone's thirsty. Anyone thirsty? Yes. <clears throat> if you're not thirsty, I can't help you. Jesus can't help you if you're not thirsty. If you don't have this soul thirst in you. I, I believe every human being does, but they satisfy it in, in wrong ways. But still that thirst remains. The Old Testament says in Isaiah 5, chapter 13, Therefore my people go into exile for lack of understanding. Those of high rank will die of hunger, and the common people will be parched with thirst. We have the richest culture on earth, I think, and yet we are so poor spiritually. We are surrounded by so much, and yet so many people are dry. They are thirsty. The world is like a dry desert. It leaves the soul thirsting, hungering for something. It's a lot like physical thirst. How many of you know that the, the doctors tell us all the time that Americans don't drink enough water? We really don't. We don't drink anywhere near enough water, they tell us. We are, many of us are in a constant state of, of dehydration and, and don't realize it. I mean, it's, you know, more or less serious, but, but it seems to just be there. We don't drink enough. That's just in the natural. That's just natural water. And I suggest to you there is even a worse dehydration in the spirit where people are so dry, they are so thirsty that they don't even realize it. Or if they do, they don't realize what... They sense there's something wrong. There is this angst. There is this grief in our culture. <clears throat> How many of you know that the greatest cause of death in young Americans is suicide? They can't take the emptiness any longer. And if you put that right next to it, it's opiate overdose. Why are so many people hooked on opiates? Because they're so dry and empty inside. And suddenly you, you find a connect, connection. You, 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 find, you find some kind of a chemical that will give you this blast of, of it's like I have just discovered the meaning for living. No, what you've discovered is a chemical that will fire off all your brain chemistry that makes you experience every kind of great feeling, but it's all false, it's all empty, and it actually ruins your brain if you keep doing it. To where nothing else, you'll never feel anything ever again if you keep after it. 
accept that drug. We are the most drug-addicted culture on earth. Why? Why is that? Well, I think it's right exactly what Jesus is getting at here. There's a thirst. A thirst. There's an emptiness. There's a brokenness. And you know what? I, I hope you can understand this. It's actually the mercy of God. It's the mercy of God you feel that. If you, or when you, let me say it that way, when you come to the recognition that there's something missing, there's, I need something. This, this ain't working for me. I've tried this, I've tried that, I've tried the other thing. I just, it just ain't working. You are in a really, really good place to hear the gospel right now. It's into that gap Jesus steps. And he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. Friends, that's the gospel right there. And it only works if you're thirsty. If you're not thirsty, you will not come. If you do not come, you will not receive. If you do not receive, you will be lost. Can you understand? There are two people living together side by side. One neighbor, the next neighbor. Two people living in the same house. One person, another person. One person senses and feels that thirst, that spiritual emptiness, that thirst. How many of you know that perception of the fact that you are empty and you need something is a gift from God? Without it, without it, you just go blithely on your life into wreck and ruin and disaster and judgment when you die. But what a gift to discover. I'm so thirsty. I need something. There's got to be more to this life than my work and money and all of this. And look, Jesus waits till the last day for a reason. If he comes out on the first day, everybody's thirsty. Physically, everybody's hungry. You know, they can't wait. You know, we get some of uh, Aunt Nelda's baked potatoes and It'll be great. We'll have a fun time. I can't wait for that. Jesus doesn't stand up then. He doesn't say anything then. After you're stuffed, after you're full, but you're still thirsty. After you've had everything, you've tried everything, you've, you've exhausted your resources, and you've been successful. You've filled your life with so many things. You've been successful at work and you're the, the sports star or you're the, you've achieved all you wanted to achieve, and yet still... It's not enough. You are thirsty. That's when Jesus steps into the scene. If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me. Let him come to me. The trouble is, people don't acknowledge, they don't recognize, they don't know that they're thirsty. If you're the, here this morning and you, you sense, I, I need something, or you can remember a time in your life when you did, you are blessed beyond all men. You are blessed of God to come to that point to know it and recognize it. Because then you can receive. So Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come. The psalmist puts it this way, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. Life is tough. Life is hard. I'm longing for something. There's an emptiness inside that cannot be filled with anything but God. And God made it that way. Not only did he put Adam and Eve out of paradise, but he took paradise out of them. Left a little emptiness, a little vacuum in them, which they have passed on to all mankind. We all have this emptiness, this thirst. It can only be filled with God. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? What a wonderful confession. David also says, For you, God, Psalm 63, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land. How many of you have ever been there? 
Jesus himself the Sermon on the Mount says blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled so Jesus says let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink see that's the key you got to come to him come to me he says don't go here don't go there which is what humans do it's almost like he is spinning off of and, and, and weaving up a tapestry uh, out of Isaiah 55 where God says, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on that which is not satisfy? Come, come to me, he says. If you're thirsty, come to me you're hungry come to me come to the waters he is the waters there are so many places that you can go in our culture today and and be amused be <laughs> be stimulated don't satisfy they don't satisfy you can spend a lot of money on all kinds of video games which are like an alternate reality and you're doing great exploits of daring do in your little imaginary world they even now have uh, virtual porn and sex where you can wear like some kind of glasses and you, you, you it's almost like 3D porn. How sick is that? There's no end to it, you see? Our culture just keeps digging it deeper and deeper and farther and farther from God. The suicide rate goes up and the addiction rate goes up because people are thirsty but they're going to the wrong places. So Jesus says to those who are thirsty, don't go there, don't go here, come to me. Come to me. You've got to come to Jesus. You're not going to find this anyplace else. Jesus in John chapter 4 was with his disciples at a well and a Samaritan woman comes. She's drawing water, and Jesus said, Give me a drink. The woman says, well, You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? Jews don't have anything to do with Samaritans. And Jesus says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would give you living water. Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. How, where will you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank himself? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. You see it? you see it? What does it mean to drink him in? So we have to first be thirsty, then we have to come to Jesus. It's a decision you make. There are lots of religions out there. There are all kinds of philosophies. There are all kinds of worldviews. And it's, you know, go check them out. Go try them, see how that works for you. And every single one of them, it's, it's you trying to please that God. And I'm telling you, there's no end to that. It's all emptiness and futility. But there's only one in which he is living water. Come to me, he says. He is a spring of living water. What you see on the screen back there is an actual spring. What is a spring? This, a spring is where... where um, water comes right up out of the ground. You might think that the ground 
that you walk on is just dirt and rocks and clay and various formations. And it certainly is all of that, but it's more. Underneath your feet, down in the ground, there are aquifers. There are cracks in the rocks in different places where water, a virtual river is flowing under your feet a lot of the time. Those of us living says that with a well we'll go down in my case we had to go down a hundred feet to hit that aquifer and we pump up fresh clean water but if you live in the mountains like they did in the Middle East and in Israel and other places it's not so much a well it's a lip it's a spring that flows right out of the ground you go to West Virginia or Pennsylvania in the mountains any place and you'll discover this it's phenomenal the water comes right up out of the ground and it flows down the hillside. And it, there is no water on earth like that. Fresh and clean. See, everybody in Jesus' day would have known exactly what he's talking about. It's so fresh, it's so clean. That's what this water is. See, kind of along the back, you see where it's just bubbling up out of the ground? It's, it's, it's coming, look how clean and how fresh it is. It's unbelievably good, this water. Jesus says, you come to me and you drink and it will be like living water to your soul. Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but when I get really thirsty, I'm out working, you know, doing a, a, a difficult job and it's hot and I'm sweaty, you know, and I'm really, really thirsty. You know what? I, 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 don't, want, I don't want Pepsi. I don't want Coca-Cola. I want water. That's what I want. When you get thirsty enough, you want water. And I've lived in the mountains, and I've seen these, these mountain springs, and there's, there's, it's so fun to be so hot and be so thirsty. One time Daniel and I, my son, are, are hiking up a mountain, and we kind of got confused and started a little, little late in the day, and we actually ended up starting about 6 o'clock in the, in, in, in the evening, hiking up this mountain, and we re didn't realize how far it was. And we just kept going and going and going. It was miles. It ended up being like six, eight miles like that. And it was dark. Now it's like midnight. And we're climbing. And we're hot. And it's July. And we're so thirsty. And we're getting closer to the top of the mountain. And I can hear it. We don't have any water. The plan was we were just going to find a spring somewhere. Couldn't find anything. We're walking. We're hiking. And I can begin to hear it. I just hear the water trickling. We run over, and there is this most beautiful spring coming right out of the side of the mountain into a pool, something similar to that. And I'll tell you, the most fun thing is I just stick my face in it and suck it in. Oh, it's so awesome. It just, there's, it's indescribable. It's indescribable how satisfying that is. God says, I will be like that to you and to your soul. It only works if you come to him come to him don't accept sugary substitutes coca-cola will not it'll it'll feel fun in your mouth and it's fizzy and all that fun stuff i like to drink coke too but when you're really soul thirsty there's nothing like this water there's nothing like jesus this is what he provides for us you have to come to jesus and finally <clears throat> You have to drink. You have to drink. It's not enough to just be thirsty. It's excellent to be thirsty. If you don't do anything but just walk around, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty. Have you ever met people like that? Life sucks. This is rotten. I hate this life. Life is so miserable. I don't know. You know, why does life have to be so hard? If there's a God, why, why is it so hard? Why doesn't he make this? Why that? Woe is me. I hate my life. Okay, we get it, Junior. We get it. We get it. You're thirsty. Great. Uh, take the next step. Come to Jesus. Come, don't come to me. I, 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 can't, I can't help you. I can't, I can't do anything. I just get, all I am is a sign. Go to Jesus. Must come to Jesus. Jesus is saying, come to me. Come to me. And it's not enough just to come to him. I mean, it's great. It's great to come to Jesus. If you just did that, if it, you know, <clears throat> I've seen people... That they, they know they're lost. They, they know they're struggling. They feel brokenness and empty. They come in church. They sit there and they do nothing. And there's living water all around them, but they won't drink. 
Jesus is right there, but they won't drink. There's just too many fences and barriers and all kinds of, well, I didn't really care for that last song. It was slightly too loud. And not, not only that, I really don't care for, you know, there should be windows. There's no windows in here. Why are there no windows in here? Or whatever. Friend, listen. I want to be careful how I say this. So I'm just going to say it. There are churches all over the landscape filled with thirsty people who present Jesus, but they never drink him in. They don't put their face in the water and suck it in, draw it in. It's not enough to just come to Jesus. You have to drink. You have to drink. Now think about that for a minute. What does it mean to drink? Jesus stood in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. You want to receive the Holy Spirit? Drink in Jesus. Just drink him in. What does that mean? Well, it, it means to be open. <clears throat> There's no actual physical corollary that I can suggest. It's it is a spiritual openness. Okay, all of your defenses are down. All of your doubt has been laid aside. All of your anger, your unforgiveness, your, your unbelief, all of it's laid down. And you just come to Jesus. Total surrender. When I come to a spring... I backpack and I'm hot and I'm thirsty and there's this gorgeous spring. As long as I stand there and look at it, it's not helping me. I appreciate it. Maybe I can even get some vibes off it. But it's not helping me. What do I have to do? I got to shed my pack. Get on my knees and drink it in drink it in. I think there's something in the physical that correlates to the spirit. If you want to drink Jesus, the knees would be a great place to start. Or a posture of openness and humility. Acknowledging our need. being lost and immersed in his presence. Come here, Lord Jesus. Come here, Lord Jesus. And he will. And he will. Now, I love this. And the Spirit will flow like a spring of water. First, he flows into us. And then he flows out from us. Isn't that cool? I like the way he puts this. Let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow out from within them. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit here. First, the Holy Spirit needs to come in me. How many of you know you can't give what you don't have? Some people ask, what's the secret of ministry? What's the secret of, of ministering to people, of being effective in ministry? Right there it is. Right there it is. If you try to do this in your own strength, it's not you learning Bible verses and, and 
you know, mastering hermeneutics, the, the art of translating scripture, understanding scripture, or, or even uh, homiletics, how, how to give a good sermon. I mean, all those things are important. They're valuable. But it won't work. It, in the final analysis, just be filled with him. Be filled with him. Be so filled with him that he's flowing into you, and it'll just flow out. There'll be a river of living water flowing out of you wherever you go. <laughs> That's the key to ministry. The Holy Spirit just flowing out. First he has to flow in, and then he flows out. Come on, worship team. That's what this whole thing is about. This is how you receive the Holy Spirit. You just drink Jesus in. This is, some people say, why do you spend so much time in worship at your church? I mean, church I went to, they sing three hymns, first and third verses, and that was it. And uh, we all enjoyed it, and, but, but we want to just move on, because actually we want to get out of here by... There's something about drinking Him in. It's not enough to just come to Jesus. You must learn to drink Him in. This is what we're trying to teach you to do. So you can actually experience this experience this. You can experience him. He's very real. He's very real. His presence is here. You can drink him in like living water. But there's so much time is it? I, I wish I had time. There's a whole other sermon called Broken Cisterns. It comes from Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah the prophet says, <clears throat> God speaking through him, he says, two evils <clears throat> have my people committed. This is God's people. Two evils have they committed. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have dug for themselves cisterns. In other words, wells like where you store water. He said, but they're broken cisterns and they hold no water. My people have done this, he said. They have forsaken me, the fountain. See, God wants to be a spring of living water to his people. And we go, no thanks, God. I'll dig my own well, thank you. God says, your well doesn't even hold water. I'm tempted to say that half the churches in America are broken cisterns. I'm not going to say that. It's not my, my place to be a judge or to be, a, to be somebody who condemns. I don't want to do that. There's plenty of really great churches out there. All I'm saying is, is that every single one of us, including this church, is in danger of doing that very thing. Where we can dig our own cisterns. We, we just have our own form. We, we ha, we ha, this is the way we've always done it. We like it this way. This way and not that way. We do this, but don't do that. And it's, and, it, and it's just us building a cistern. You can do this in your own personal life as well. Where rather than drawing on the power of the Holy Spirit and, and coming to Jesus and drinking from him deeply and allowing there to be a flow of, of living water in your life, it's, it's just so easy sometimes. You just kind of get into a get into a rut. I'm doing it my way in my own strength and my own what pleases me trouble is it's they are broken cisterns they are broken cisterns they hold no water i have a suggestion let's go back to god who is the fountain of living water let's go back to him and let us drink deeply from him so let me ask is anybody here thirsty anybody here thirsty well god bless you god bless you if you are that's half the battle. <laughs> Jesus says, come to me and drink. And then out of you will flow rivers of living water. Let's all stand and worship God together. And as you stand, we've been kind of doing this through the series. As you stand, would you kind of assume the position? Just sort of put your hands like this. This is just an attitude of surrender. I know it's really hard. I would have you get on your knees, but it's like almost impossible. Uh, at, you know, with the slow floor and the configuration of the room and all. So why don't we just sort of just put our hands like this. And I'm going to lead.
lead you in a prayer and then we're just going to worship together for a few minutes. Lord Jesus, Lord, we confess every sin we've ever committed to you, God. We confess to you, Lord, all of our sins, our brokenness, our stubbornness, our willfulness, our lust, our anger, our unforgiveness, all the rest of it. Lord, we confess it to you. Lord, you said you are faithful and just and you'll forgive us our sins, Lord, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, God. So, Lord, we come to you. Lord, we want to drink deeply from you. Lord, do that to that song that you ended on. Better come to the altar. Hmm? Yeah, come to the altar. Yeah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's sing this song together. Just continue to drink from him. Are you hurting and broken within?
precious blood Ooh, we're thirsty for you, God We're desperate for you, God Oh, we're thirsty for you, God Fill us and change us and empower us, purify us. 